You're listening to Biz Quick. This is where Julie and Corey provide quick and useful information to small business owners. Biz Quick is the podcast where small business owners get to showcase their businesses and receive expert advice and guidance in areas many entrepreneurs struggle with. And you, the listener, get solutions, tips, and tricks on real world topics that many small business owners face. Julie and Corey are the experts small businesses hire when they need solutions. And the BizQuick podcast is just one way they deliver those solutions. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to BizQuick. I'm Corey. And I'm Julie. And on today's show, we have Kay Ross. She is a marketing coach and consultant and an improv uh, expert. And she's going to be on the show a little bit later. But first, we're going to talk about sales and cold calling and all of that awkward stuff that none of us really like to do. Well, some people like to do cold calling and um, some people, but I, I think if people say they love cold calling, they've either never done it or they're liars. Um, I don't mind it, but I think, you know, where cold calling or just sales in general becomes is interesting for us right now is we're trying a lot of different things. And I, when I say we, I really mean me, right? Because we are, um, we have a new program, um, Foundation 52, and working on selling that. And we're selling that a little bit differently than most things. So um, I'm taking some risks in how we're marketing. Yeah. And we're trying different things. Uh, neither Julie of us were had a sales background going into this, especially like in the, the, the cold calling consultant sales, like all of that. I mean, I, I was in restaurants for years, but that's easy. When somebody's in your door, you can upsell and, and, and all of that. Like, getting somebody to try and buy a product that they don't know they want to buy is tough. Yeah. And you know, that's where (laughs) addressing the pain, like understanding what their pain is and um, being able to offer up solutions for that pain comes into play. But when you're doing something cold, right. Where you don't know if the person even has a pain then it's, it becomes a little bit risky, right? Where you're making some, I guess, bold choices and, and you're, you're taking some action on what you're, how you're going to market it or try and sell it. Right. So I just recently tried this new approach where I'm, we're doing some cold emailing, right? So, you know, that we're reaching out to small businesses that we think would be really good, um, customers for our new program. And I created a video that I have put into the emails that I've been sending to everybody. And that was a little bit, um, that was new for me. I've not ever done that before. And at first I didn't even really know how to do it. And I had to figure that out, but then what to say in the video, because I cold email. So I got to really introduce myself and SB pace and the program. And I got to do it all in less than 60 seconds to keep them interested. Well, it's like any kind of elevator pitch or, or you've got such a short window. I mean, especially in emails, like in the, in the elevator pitch, at least you, you have their undivided attention for the, the length of the elevator ride in an email. Like you have to grab them the subject. You have to grab them the first line. Like they have to, like, it, it's tough. Um, and knowing your audience is, is the hard part. And like, when you actually get that person on the phone, whether it's a cold call or they reached out or whatever, like being able to hear what they're not saying. Like you were talking earlier about like finding that pain point. They're not going to come straight at you and say, Hey, I suck at this help. Yeah. It's kind of funny. So I participate, you know, every day pretty much on this, like in this sales group where we kind of address particular parts of the sales process and just what, what do people, what does everybody do for this, whatever part we're talking about. And um, yesterday we were talking about um, the conversation, the topic was on identifying the pain, like addressing their pain point. And it was more like, how do you figure out what their pain is? And I was the only person in the group who said, I just ask them, like, is that the wrong approach? <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm not, you know, and I think sometimes there's really, there's a lot of disadvantages to not being like this expert in sales, but there's a lot of advantages too, because I'm not really following any rules. So I'm like, I just ask them, what's, what's your biggest pain? 
Well, and not following any rules and not following any scripts either, yeah. which we all hate because that's one thing that we can we can all tell when you get a phone call, a, a marketing call, and it's just somebody reading something and you give an answer and they go, it's like that choose your own adventure when you're you know, a kid, like one of those books. It's like, if they say A, you go here. If they say B, you go here. Yeah, it's it's boring and, and it's impersonal and, and we've all figured it out by now. Yeah, I don't I don't have any scripts. I don't know if I'm supposed to have scripts. Um, I know, you know, uh, most people I think that are like experts at sales would tell you you should have some. Um, but I feel like for me, it becomes a lot less authentic. And I think that's one of our differentiators is that we are, you know, we spend a lot of time on that upfront sales process of really understanding what somebody's problem is and how we can best help them. And we kind of customize solutions for people. So it's not like, oh, hey, we have solution A and, you know, and solution B. And it's like, well, you don't really fit into either, but I'm going to push solution A because it costs more money. Um, we, that's not how we do it at all. We're really like, what do you serve? And perfect example, I was talking to somebody yesterday who's interested in starting a new business. And, you know, we have two packages for helping people start businesses. We have one that's just really like startup services light and it's kind of a boot camp. And we give you like, you know, X hours of time and then we get you up and running, but you're doing a lot of the work yourself. And then we have the one that's more like, we're going to hold your hand, get you all the way through it. We do the bulk of the work and um, it's a really, we make it a really great experience. Both of them are great experiences, but we make, the, the second one is just very, very hands-on and high touch. And um, the person that I talked to yesterday was kind of in the middle. She's like, well, I want more than this, but I don't know that I need all of this because there are, you know, this is not my first business. And so I was like, well, how about if I send you the list of everything that's included in the full package and just kind of go through it and let me know which ones you don't need. And then we'll have a conversation and we'll figure out from there what we're going to do. So, you know, and that was, you know, spur of the moment, you know, sort of improving my way through that conversation and figuring out how can we best help this person and solve her problems. Yeah. And I think that we've improved our way through this podcast so far. <laughs> <laughs> I have yes. no idea what we were going to talk about leading into this. We just knew that, uh, Kay is, is into improv, so we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with Kay. What's up, everybody? My name is Trent from Hustle Energy, and I created the Hustle Focused Energy product out of my own need when I couldn't focus on my side hustle to take it to the next level. So many products are chock full of caffeine and sugar and other harmful substances. So what I did is I created something that is a powder drink mix designed to help you focus without the need of caffeine. But if you'd like to learn more about this product, go check out the website hustle.energy and follow me on Instagram as well at hustle.energy. All right, welcome back. We have Kay Ross on with us. She's an Australian living in Hong Kong. She's a marketing coach and consultant, an improv performer, and has her own program, Playground of Possibilities. Welcome, Kay. Thank you, Corey. Nice to be here. Hey, Kay. It's nice to see Hi, you. Julie. Thank you. Australian living in Hong Kong. Mm. Let's just start there. How did that happen? Uh, uh, I decided it was time for an adventure and a challenge and an opportunity. I grew up in Adelaide in Australia and in 1993 I just decided I'm moving to Hong Kong and I've been here for 27 years. Wow. So you're, you're basically, what do they call it, a Hong Kongite now? No, well, not quite, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you have an interesting approach to helping people deal with um, improving their, I guess, speaking skills, but even more than that, like mindset, which is um, talking with or doing improv or using the improv techniques. Am I, is this the right way to, to say uh, it? I would call it the improv mindset. Okay. Uh, I, so I perform improv or maybe people know it as improvisation, which is when a team of players create theater on the spot without a script, usually based on suggestions from the audience 
completely unpredictable random suggestions from the audience. So some of your listeners might be familiar with the show Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's what that's one style of improvisation or improv, and, and that's the style that my team does. And what a lot of improvisers around the world have discovered is that the underlying principles and skills and mindset that improvisers use on stage without a script are actually very useful off stage in life and business because life and business don't come with a script. Mm -hmm. And so like many other improvisers around the world, I teach corporate workshops for clients who want to build their their soft skills, the so-called soft skills of business and life, which are things like teamwork, leadership, communication, creativity, emotional intelligence, and handling change in the unexpected, which happens all the time because we don't have a script when we get up in the morning and go to work. So, yeah, and I find that, that clients find that really, really useful. And, of course, I apply it in my own life as well. I tend to live improvisationally um, because improv is all about, you know, the creativity and, and being open to opportunities and, and listening. Listening is one of the big skills of improvisation. We, we have to listen to each other because we don't have a script. Uh, it's about making bold choices and taking action even when you don't have all the information you think you need in a situation. It's about being willing to take risks and being comfortable with uncertainty and mistakes. Yeah. If this is fascinating to me. I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, how could I learn this and apply it to sales, right? So I handle sales for mm -hmm. the company and it would be great to have more of an improv mindset. I don't really use a script for sales and that's more because Good. I don't yeah. have a sales background. And so I wouldn't even know how to create one. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of am improv, but it's, I tend yeah. to refer to it as um, just sort of think about it intuitively what to do next and then kind of wing it. But if there's, you know, some skills that I can improve on that are going to help improve my close rate, mm -hmm. I want to learn them. Yeah. Well, there are trainers all around the world and, and improv companies, improv groups around the world who can teach you a workshop about the skills of improv. So I'm sure you can find one where you near where you live. Um, I know as a customer myself, I hate it when I get a phone call, a cold call from someone who's clearly using a script to try and sell me a product or service. Yeah, I hate that. Um, so it really is about listening and, and just the emotional intelligence of not just listening to the words that someone says, but the tone of voice they're using and, and what they're not saying. I mean, ideally, it's better if you can see them because then you you can see their facial expressions and their gestures. So it really, emotional intelligence, I think, is one of the really big things that I've learned about from, from performing improv. Oh, in fact, I've been an actor since I was a teenager. It is about authenticity, though. It's, it's not pretending to be who you're not when you're doing your sales calls. It, it's definitely about authenticity and, and being genuine. And... It's about being willing to change tack quickly. If you notice that what you're doing isn't working, you have to be, you have to think, thinking on your feet and being able to change direction quickly when, when your potential client says or does something that makes you realize, oh, I'm not quite getting through to them the way I wanted to. So, so all of the skills that, that improvisers use, you can apply in your sales calls. And it's, it's funny because it's kind of a, it's definitely a two-way street that I don't think a lot of people think about in terms of like the, if you're doing cold calls or whatever, like, like not only uh, do you have to read your, your, your client or your potential client, like you, they're reading you as well. And I had, I had, um, 
a, uh, just an awful time in one of my undergrad classes we had to do cold calling as part of like a lab that we were doing and it was just awful and I could tell that everybody who was on the other line knew that I did not want to be a part of this so it's just like look I'm just doing this for a grade um, can you just spend like 30 seconds listening to this script and that's all I want to do <laughs> yeah oh that sounds horrible yeah yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. I yeah. I was thinking too, as you were talking about, you know, the listening and the tone and whatnot, and it's, you know, so much of um, really having a good and meaningful conversation, regardless if it's sales or just, you know, relationships or whatever is really mm -hmm. listening and understanding the tone and understanding that um, people, sometimes people just don't they're not what they're not saying. Right. I loved when you said that, but I was also thinking about the, you know, increased use of text messaging and how people imply or they infer tone, right. You know, Corey can send me a text message and I'm like, why are you so angry? And he's like, all I asked you was when will this be done? Right. Yeah. So how do you, is there any um, correlation there that you can sort of well, leverage for improv? I, it, I agree. It is oftentimes very difficult to understand the the implied meaning in a in a text message because you you can easily misinterpret it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I guess with improv, um, hmm, we don't use text messaging in improv. <laughs> in um, and it's the next best thing I, you can use that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess it's it's not jumping to conclusions about what someone meant, but but just really listening and asking questions and, and um, building on what they've said. In in improv, we have a saying, the, the mantra of improv you may have heard is called yes and. Yes and. What that means is we accept what someone is saying. We don't necessarily have to like it or agree with it, but we accept that this is the truth of the situation for them that's in front of us right now. And that we, you know, we, we're willing to listen to them and at least give them space and the respect to say what they want to say. And then we build on it. We add to it. Hmm. So instead, of, instead of blocking them with a yes, but which is what most of us tend to do, we, we learn, we practice saying or approaching a situation with a yes and mentality, which means we're genuinely interested in what the other person has to say instead of shutting them down with a yes, but, or a no. I, I, I like that. It's so, it's so much more open, right? To say yes yeah. and rather than yes, but... Um, I want to circle back to something that you said earlier where you talked about an improv mindset is really about bold choices and taking action. And I'm wondering if you can just kind of fill in some more color on that. Well, when we're performing improv on stage, the audience is waiting for something to happen. We haven't got five minutes to stand in the wings at the side of the stage and think about, oh, what, what shall I do? What shall I do? We tend to step in even before we've figured out in our logical brain what am I going to say what am I going to do we allow our whole body to guide us and we, we step in and in the process of doing that something from our subconscious will bubble up and we'll open our mouth and say something because we haven't prepared the script in advance mm -hmm. yeah so in life that means sometimes we take action before we, before our logical brain thinks we're ready. Yeah, so it, it's just about having the courage to take action, knowing that you'll get some feedback from the marketplace. And then you can change course if necessary. So, so it's, I mean, sure, planning is, planning is useful in, in real life off stage. And sometimes it's also useful to jump in and take action before you think you're ready. Yes, which is really um, a very much an entrepreneur mindset, right? Yeah, and yeah. I, I just, I had a conversation with a client this morning who 
um, he told me that, you know, his, his business partner was feeling really overwhelmed with just the entire concept of being an entrepreneur and was kind of yeah. regretting leaving their corporate job because they liked the predictability of a paycheck every Friday. And yeah. I'm like, look, sure. I, nobody loves being paid on Friday more than I do, but I don't want to be constrained. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it's, it's that, you know, leaping even before you're ready. Um, you know, like I, I always say my favorite verb is start, just start, just, just yes. do it. So, yes. but I think it also, you know, if, if I am interpreting or sort of digesting correctly what you're saying, and I'm just going to take a leap here, I'm going to do it yes. and say it, it's a little bit about not censoring yourself as well. And just having mm. faith that you're going to mm-hmm. say or do the right thing. And if not, that you can yes. course correct, which is kind of scary yes. right now. Right. Well, yeah, and it's interesting you said that because I remember I remember watching a video of the very famous comedian uh, Robin Williams, and the the interviewer asked him, "Well, how do you you you've got such a quick mind? How do you think so quickly?" And what Robin Williams said was, "It's not about the thinking quickly; it's about switch temporarily switching off that part of your brain, that editing part of your brain that says." oh, it's not good enough, they won't like this, it's not going to work, it'll fail, whatever. No, it's And what we do, so what we do on stage as improvisers is we switch off that part of our brain Yeah, that, that says it's not going to be good enough. Right. And, we and, take action. and we kind of live in a world right now where almost, well, most things that we see are really, really staged, right? If you just think about social media, yeah. um, there's not a lot of, authenticity we're seeing people's highlight reels so it's mm-hmm. this let me take another picture another picture another picture till i get a really good one yeah. and then um and then i'll publish that so there's people aren't like even whether it's you know images of themselves or what they're saying it's just edited and censored so much yeah yeah and th- I, I was just thinking as well there's a one element of what we do as performers, or improv performers, or actors, any kind of actors, is that I think is relevant to business and entrepreneurship is the issue of um, in improv we call it status. So it's not about one person being more worthy than anybody else, but it's about the behaviour. What can we do with our behaviour in the way we relate to people, the way we communicate with people? when you learn and practice improv skills, you become skilled at having a wider repertoire of behaviors. So you don't always behave in always in the same way all the time, whoever you're with. Again, it's not about pretending to be somebody other than who you are, but it's about having the skill to sometimes when it's necessary, you elevate the other person and you're a bit more humble. Or the other way around, if you want to be higher than the other person, for whatever reason. And that, you know, that skill of being able to adapt your behaviour in different situations, adapt the the way you treat the other person can be useful in a sales conversation, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that I mean, we all know is that obviously repetition, you, like you get better as you, you do it over and over and over again, like as you practice. And, and that's yeah. one thing that everybody, we all know, and, and that's something that we all need to do. But for a lot of people that first step, because I'm sure that you've had plenty of bad performances in your career, like plenty of like, oh man, that like embarrassing, you know, whatever, um, uh-huh. getting over that, getting past that fear. I mean, how, you know, the, 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 cliched answer is, well, you just start, just get out there. But for people who are hesitant to start, like how do they make that first step? Again, I think the best advice I can give is find an improv workshop class somewhere near, even if it's just an introductory one. Now I'm not saying that people have to want to get up on stage and perform, be an improv performer. No, that's not what it's about. And it's certainly not about telling jokes and being funny. That's, that's stand-up comedy. That's something different. But even just taking one class, and improv teachers are very friendly. 
it, it's not about being a star on stage. It's about learning and practicing the skills and the mindset. So, yeah, I, I would recommend people find an improv class somewhere near them. Mm. I, yeah. I, I love that. I'm kind of curious. Corey and I do this um, uh, thing with our business where we have these imagination sessions, right? Mm. Where um, we try to do it once a month. Um, it's supposed to be the first Monday of the month, but this particular last, <laughs> yeah, on this Monday has, was very, very brutal. So we didn't do it yet this month. But essentially the imagination session is literally just, um, we pick like a particular problem or something that we want to do, right? So whether it could be like, what's, what are all the ways we could roll out this new product or what are the different ways we could, like, how do we solve our capacity issue or whatever it is, right? doesn't matter what it is, just we're, we're looking at one thing and then we just remove like all the barriers. Like if anything was possible, what mm. would we do? And we just whiteboard yeah. out and, you know, every idea that we come up with and there's no wrong answers. There's no, yeah no restrictions against what we can say. And then when we're done with the brainstorming part, then we just kind of go through and be like, well, which ones are viable and which ones work. But that yeah. initial part is a little improv. It kind of correlates to it. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's the creativity coming up with all sorts of crazy ideas. So that's, that's what's called divergent thinking, coming up with lots of ideas. Then the convergent thinking is, as you say, it's assessing those and saying, well, no, that one's not appropriate or we haven't got the budget for that or that one's against the law or that one's not consistent with our values and mission, whatever. But come up with lots of ideas first and then choose the ones that seem most likely to succeed. Yeah, I that love that. Yeah. I, I, I think all businesses should, should do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and even in like families and relationships, it's just a really yeah. good exercise. Um, so we need to start wrapping, but before we do that, I want you to tell us a little bit about project, uh, your project playground of possibilities. Like we're really interested in learning more about that and what that's about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it is, it actually um, picks up on a lot of the topics that we've already discussed. Um, things like mindset and, and creativity and thinking and what if, the what if question you, you mentioned are coming up with lots of ideas. And it's about letting go of your old limiting thoughts and beliefs and stories about yourself, choosing more useful ones, seeing bigger possibilities for yourself, taking action and improvising or experimenting with new more resourceful more joyful ways of being and that all came about because I'm as well as being interested in marketing and improvisation and healing I'm interested in personal development and and our mindset so I've created a card deck a tool not a toy but a tool called the playground of possibilities and the idea just popped into my head one day and I came up with a, uh, a card deck with 52 questions for people to ask themselves that they can apply in, in all areas of their life. And I've picked some of the questions here to tell you about. So every question starts with what would be possible for me if I. Okay. Meaning what positive results would be possible for me. So it is about imagination and storytelling. What, wow, what would be possible for me if I, if I stopped playing it safe? If I let go of all my excuses? If I lived life playfully? If I asked for help? That's a big one for entrepreneurs, isn't it? Business people. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Some of us more than others. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what would be possible for me if I let go of my belief that I'm not, insert your own adjective, blank, if I'm not, something enough if I'm not good enough if I'm not rich enough if I'm not talented enough if I'm not smart enough if I'm not young enough all the what ifs that we worry about is, is yeah. there any is there any coaching that comes along with this or is it like like how does um, that uh, I mean like instruction I could uh, yeah, yeah in in the card deck that I've created there's a couple of cards with with some tips about how to use it and, okay. and the website as well. So yes, yeah. Gotcha. Um, and I've also um, 
led workshops, live workshops, where I used the card deck and some impro cooperative improvisational games, not performance, not performing, but just some games, some exercises um, to play with these questions. Yeah. Sure. Great. Well, can you tell our audience how they can find you, what they can, you know, where they can reach you on the internet? And how they can yeah. buy your card, your card deck. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, well, I have two websites. The first one is just my name, kross.com, www.kross.com. And people can find information there about my marketing work and the improvisational work. And then my other website is just playgroundofpossibilities.com playgroundofpossibilities.com, which is all about the card deck. And they can order the card deck there awesome. online. Yeah. Great. Are you on any social media platforms? Well, yes, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. People can find me there. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Kay. And thanks to our listeners and all that information you can find in the show notes. Yep. And you can connect with us on social media. We are also on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and we're on Instagram. And you can also reach us on our websites, sbpace.com and bizquickpodcast.com. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to our podcast, like us, give us a review. We love feedback. And if there are topics that you want us to cover on the podcast, send us a note about that as well. We are always interested in giving our listeners what they want to hear about. And oh, we wrote a book. It's a number one bestseller on Amazon and it comes with a companion digital workbook. That's it for today's podcast. I'm Corey. And I'm Julie. And this was BizQuick, helping small businesses across America.